what uh, I think we will start with um, in this panel is just asking our panelists um, to say a few words about uh, them, but specifically, what brought you into quantum? So, um, and we'll just go start there with you, Chris, and then for the other question, we go the other way. So, please. Okay, so uh, what brought me into quantum? Um, well, uh, basically, I was initially attracted to the weirdness of quantum mechanics, I have to admit. As an undergraduate, uh, you know, I, I, I was so bored with, like, freshman physics. Uh, I could, could not literally make myself go to class. Uh, I had friends who would, you know, t tell me when the exams were, and, and I, could, I could pass the course. Um, but when I found all this great weird stuff about quantum mechanics and uh, partial differential equations, this really excited me. And then I took a first graduate course in the subject uh, at Nebraska where I was an undergraduate and, and uh, learned the, the, the beautiful underlying unity of it all. And, and then I was really hooked and carried on in graduate school working with Hugo Fano. So, well, in my case, uh, my PhD is actually in physics, and I, in my research, I was largely driven by curiosity, as uh, one of famous uh, academicians from the former Soviet Union say, when he was asked about uh, defined the physics, he would say, physics is the way to satisfy your curiosity at the expense of taxpayers. So that was pretty much my approach. Uh, but then I moved to Purdue, and actually it's, it's, it's had a tremendous uh, effect on me. Uh, I started to be driven, technology driven in my research. I always thought that, look, if there are two equally exciting problems, why not, would not you do the one which is, has potentially big technological impact? So, and uh, before that I was working on metamaterials, which is, I'm still doing a little bit of that, which is exciting, but uh, to some point it's, I found that it's a, a little bit too simple. And I realized that the, in terms of technology, nothing could be compared impact-wise as quantum. I realized that quantum technology revolution is coming and it's gonna change our lives. And that's what, uh, basically, that's what affected my decision. Okay, be, believe it or not, what brought me to quantum physics is a very bad teacher in quantum physics. <laughs> Actually, uh, my study were mostly classical physics, and in contrast to Chris, I loved classical physics. I loved everything. I love every physics. And I had a very bad professor in quantum physics. I knew that I needed quantum physics to understand the structure of matter, how light is emitted, uh, absorbed, uh, etc., or understanding how I can fit what I understood quite well, that the light is a wave, and merge that with the fact that they tell me that there are photons. What? How can I describe that? And my teacher was awful. And uh, uh, I went, I spent three years in Africa as a so instead of doing my military, I was teaching there. And you know, when you are far from your family, etc., you have plenty of free time. In addition, in the afternoon, it was very warm, so hot, so we were staying home, you know. And at the moment, there was a fantastic book which was published. It was a book by Claude Cointergy, you know, on quantum, my Bible. And uh, so I got the Bible from France, somebody was traveling from France, so I got the Bible and I studied everything from first page one to page 1300 and, uh, and something. And uh, I was, then I was lucky when I came back to France, I was looking for an interesting subject, somebody handed me the paper by John Bell. Young people, in 74 there was not internet, okay? and. Uh, to get papers, you had to go to libraries. But the paper of Bell had been published in a rare journal. So there were only a handful of copies. And somebody gave me the paper of John Bell. I read that paper and I say, this is the most fantastic problem I have ever seen. Settling a debate between Bohr and Einstein with an experiment, I want to do that. So this is how I get interested. And uh, as Vlad, then 
uh, I move to something else, laser cooling of atom, which is still quantum physics, but different one. But then I realized that only later that they could be quantum technology. Actually, I cite Arthur Eckert and quantum cryptography because I was in a conference with cold atoms and a young guy came, sat in front of me and said, do you know, Professor, he was respectful, do you know, Professor, that with your entangled photon, one can do quantum cryptography? I say, what? It was Arthur Eckert. He was very young and came, and from that moment, I began to be interested in an application of entanglement. And now I am excited. Plenty of my former students have made startup company. I am involved in some of them, etc. I'm very excited, and maybe I will see a perfect error-corrected quantum computer before the end. Well, we'll get to that in just a moment. York, your turn. I think for me it's a slow process. Well, first of all, when I start to study or do physics, you can't avoid quantum. But more seriously, um, you know, over the years, I start to hear these lectures about quantum. I, by the way, almost, I think, 2005, I, you gave a lecture at the right when I was postdoc. So I remember, I, I think your first half of the lecture, I still remember things from that lecture, which I also remember today. Thank so you. that, yeah. Thank you. That's the best thing for a professor. It's the most wonderful <laughs> right, thing right. for a professor. Right? So that's why the lecture certainly intrigued me. But it's a slow process. I think I got more interest, seriously interested in quantum in the more recent years. A lot of activity uh, at the Purdue certainly helped. Uh, you, we heard some of that. But, but I remember uh, in 2011, you know, we built a Boson Asconsey here, a Ruby and BC experiment. And when my students start turning the microwave and, or RF, we did the modern version of a stern Galaxy experiment. We see this cloud can oscillate from one spin state to another, which will cause it's a spatially different position. And you see this Dwabi oscillation in these movies, even though that's exactly what you expect, but that's still very striking. You see quantum physics in front of your eyes. I think that's really a kind of watch that moment. And later, of course, uh, I think Feynman, we all call them, I mean, he used to say, you know, the one most important message is words made of uh, atoms. But, but now watching these uh, second quantum revolution, slowly, I mean, maybe early on, these quantum information science seem to be this exotic stuff and pretty special. But over, over the time, you start to realize now there's a, as you said, you can control individual quantum objects, individual atoms, individual quanta. And more so, you can build these individual quanta, even assemble a new world of fully controllable atom or artificial atom. I think that's really, really intriguing. I think that new world will be very different from today. So I, I think that's a very fundamental change and I, I really interesting in this aspect. I think you just motivated a bunch of folks to join Quantum. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> so uh, I would say I would pick out the moment when I thought that Quantum could have technological relevance and that was, uh, something I hadn't considered before. It was in around 2004, 2005, and I was still working at Bell Labs, and we were interested in this phenomenon called the fractional quantum Hall effect, and that was, uh, you know, the Bell Labs was sort of the center of, of research in this particular field. But uh, there were some new concepts coming out uh, from mathematicians and um, physicists Alexei Kateyev and Michael Friedman uh, saying how topology, which the fractional quantum Hall effect is sort of the uh, archetype topological phase may have a connection to computing and it may actually offer a path towards computing that is uh, in, at least in principle robust. And so that's when it really changed for me that this could actually, I could combine quantum, my interest in quantum mechanics and, and, and quantum devices to something that may have technological relevance. And that's where it really took off for me in trying to build qubits and involved in uh, building scalable platforms. Well, well, definitely the humanity is very lucky that we have many beautiful minds that actually joined. You have to tell us your, <laughs> your answer. <laughs> Give us your answer. Oh, I am the panelist actually also. I am the moderator. <laughs> uh, well, well, I have to tell you, yes, um, and that's actually part of the discussion that I think uh, we will have, that I always was very scared of quantum. And uh, it was very intimidating. It was similar to what we discussed at lunch. Uh, 
I graduated the, the best technical school in Moscow, founded by Landau and Kapitsa in applied physics and math. Um, but uh, I was doing optics and semiconductor lasers and then my PhD in electrical engineering. And every time I would come back, they would say, well, Sasha, but that's not physics. That's what you're doing is not physics. Um, so quantum was too much physics to me. And I thought, um, you know, I'm not up to quantum. It's too hard and too challenging. And I think many young people would find it a little bit intimidating to do quantum. So working with, uh, you know, integrated optics, uh, nano-optics, metamaterial plasma one, it was something very uh, tangible. You know, I could go to the clean room, I could do devices, and I could see them, I could measure, and quantum was something, you know, really far out. Um, and I have to thank my dear colleague and my dear husband, uh, who, like a few years back, well, 10 years, I guess, a decade back, uh, together with Chris and, and Professor Andy Weiner, uh, started this quantum initiative here at Purdue as a part of uh, engineering preeminent teams as one of the future areas uh, where we could have a big impact. And then I thought, well, um, I have no choice. I, I just have to, you know, uh, go along with the quantum wave. And um, I'm, it's exciting, um, it's challenging, and I'm learning. I'm learning from the colleagues, from uh, great minds like yourself. I'm learning from my students. Um, and I'm excited to continue to learn every single day. So, and uh, we all have different paths. And as I said, we are lucky that uh, so many of us joined this wave. Um, and as we heard from the lecture and already during the discussion, um, we are already witnessing a lot of progress um, in uh, um, both fundamental discoveries, but also in applications. So I would like to come back to startups um, and to this um, short-term, long-term things that, and, and applications that are going to change our daily lives. So we'll start with you, Mike. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't quite get the question. Can so yes, we. I would like to hear um, about your uh, vision of short-term and long-term impact. Uh, maybe that's a startup company that you see bringing things on the market uh, within a very short period of time, or something which is already on the market, mm -hmm. and also something that you think would be big on a longer term, so long-term and short-term impact of quantum science and technology. So uh, long-term is easier for, for me, is uh, this prospect of a utility-scale quantum computer where we can actually have societal impact. The, the, the tool is of sufficient complexity and reliability that we can make an impact in material science and quantum chemistry uh, and sort of uh, compress, say, uh, many years of trial and error chemistry into uh, a few years and, and translate that into useful products. That would be something that I see as a, a long-term uh, payoff from the work in trying to develop more robust qubits. Uh, Short-term, as Professor uh, Aspe has already mentioned, quantum key distribution is working now. You can have these uh, uh, be setups and, and it, it will have it going between here and Chicago not too long. And so I can see in terms of uh, quantum communications being much more uh, of a near term application that we will see, you know, there's hardware that can be commercialized right now. I haven't worked in startups, I've only worked for very large corporate or associated with very large corporations, so I, I don't have that. Uh, uh, feel for how things work in a startup, but you see it, you know, certainly in the area of uh, the Rydberg atom quantum computers. There's a uh, certainly a number of small companies that are coming up and in trapped ions as well that are smaller than the large corporations that I'm used to, but are making significant impact. And so I can see uh, working in one of those as being an exciting area for young people to go into and having a a company where there's only, uh, say, 100 or 150 people uh, trying to really develop a technology, I could see that as just being, if I were back in my 20s, something that I, that I would love to do. 
And for young people, indeed, quantum is a very interesting area of development in, in uh, both research, uh, fundamental research and applications, because um, the advancements are happening at the universities and companies almost at the same time. You know, it's not like there was a discovery in 30 years after the common industry. This is happening now and everywhere at different angles. So you should take uh, this opportunity. Yong, your vision, your opinion on long-term and short-term. Um, it's harder to predict, of course. Uh, of course, these are application we heard quantum computing may be a bit more futuristic and near-term quantum computing. Some of these are already happening. I would add, I think there's a great potential for quantum sensing or these experiment measurement to make an impact in the relevant near term. I think uh, depending on how you count, I mean, maybe, maybe atomic clock is more of the first quantum, but, but there are already very good uh, examples of the you know, quantum sensing that is uh, making impact. And big, another reason is you don't need necessarily 100,000 very, very good qubits or you know, couple, you know, couple hundred perfect qubits to make a you know, very impactful quantum computer. Perhaps you just need a few not so great qubits, but they may be already okay as quantum sense do measurement. So I think in that regard, quantum sense I feel can make a near impact. Very long term, I go back to that uh, play around the words with the Feynman. I truly find this quantum synthesis, or what I call synthetic quantum measure, is really intriguing because today's material is made of atoms we cannot control. But now you have ability to assemble new system, we can call it material, that every atom you can control the quantum state. That new synthetic matter will have a property we don't even have a name for today. I don't know, I have no idea what it would, but I feel that capability is really a key open the new world. I think that's in the long term is going to be extremely impactful, even though I cannot predict what impact would be, but I think that will be very impactful, that ability. Well, <clears throat> predicting uh, again is very difficult, especially about future, okay? Yes, um, predicting the past, it's already difficult, <laughs> but the fu fu future is really difficult. But uh, uh, of course, I would be impressed to see a quantum computer, as you said, uh, saving years of random and error trials in the laboratory, for instance, for drugs, and having a first pre-filtering with quantum computer to say, okay, among 1,000 possible drugs, this one and this one and this one have a chance, and then on this one you should try on mice and, and things like that. I think that there is, I hope that there is something like that. But uh, what I, I prefer to, to tell uh, young people is that you should realize that uh, going from a uh, basic research lab to uh, application, maybe in a startup or maybe in a bigger company, is a totally different world, but it's just as interesting. Personally, I love technology. And you know, I gave you the example of the gravimeter with ultra-cold atom and interference of uh, ultra-cold atoms, etc. The people who were in my lab, they, uh, every other hour, they had to readjust the lasers because the lasers were not exactly on the right line. They had to work five years to have a laser which every day stays on the same line of rubidium and it's very narrow because it's ultra cold atoms. But these five years of engineering is extremely interesting, challenging, because when it doesn't work as you like, it's not just trying by chance, it's thinking. You have to find what is the reason, physics, you know, you have to think about physics. I should try to understand why it does not say, is it a matter of atmospheric power, pressure? Is it equation of temperature? Is it equation of acoustic waves, etc.? So you have to understand, to fully use all you know in physics to fix the problem progressively. So you should realize that uh, it, you have plenty of opportunities in these companies, in these startups, and in order not to be disappointed, you must realize that it is a different work. But it's really fascinating, as fascinating as a police uh, forensic uh, investigation or something like that. Find, yes, <laughs> find why your laser doesn't want to stay stable. It was a detective story. 
<laughs> right? I like police investigation thing. <laughs> uh, well, at, I guess uh, long term, it's not a brain. Of course, quantum computing, that's what excites the broad community. Uh, short term, I think that's what matters most. And why I believe it matters most? Because we have to be careful. I mean, now we enjoy this uh, period when everybody's in love with quantum, but we have to be careful not, not to create too much hype. Like people expect, let's say, in two years quantum computer and nothing comes out of this and they would basically give up on us. So we have to be very careful in what we promise. And in that regard, I mean, I agree again that in terms of what already we demonstrated this quantum simulation, basically you mimic some problem with real quantum system like Rydberg Adams, whatever. You run this experiment, you read it back and say, hey, now I could solve shastri suzerland model, but who cares who knows about this shastri suzerland model except few people. I think uh, the challenge now is to show for broad audience that these quantum simulations, which already become available, could make a difference. Like, run a problem, let's say, related to financial market, whatever. Just if you would be able to, let's say, mimic it to some Hamiltonian Kitai for, let's say, uh, Eisen Hamiltonian, and run it and show something which people would say, wow, and which would be understandable to the broad audience. That could make a difference. That would uh, be really important for us. So I guess my point here is, Let's be careful. Let's show something to the broad audience that everyone could understand. Say, yeah, hey, it looks, look, it looks like they're making a difference. It looks like it is really important. They're not just wasting our taxpayers' money. They're, they're really doing something valuable. Yeah, I like these, these comments. I, uh, I'm a little bit the skeptic in this group. I'm not prepared to bet the family farm that there will be a universal quantum computer that really uh, has the pro what, what seems to be promised or you know the, the thrust of a lot of these initiatives out there. But there's plenty of other things quantum that are realistic and, and, and to me are very exciting. Um, certainly the, the quantum chemistry drug design, like Alain uh, uh, mentioned, that, that's going on in drug companies today. I mean, th this is a, a major industry. Uh, solving Schrodinger's equation to, to predict what drugs are, are you know, worth trying in different scenarios. It's a, a very big industry. Um, learning how to make new materials uh, by getting better at solving the quantum equations, the Schrodinger equation, the many body theories, uh, you know, and this combined with artificial intelligence and machine learning, because you have such a huge parameter space you, to, to design new materials, you know, uh, cement that, that, that doesn't, uh, you know, lose, lose heat, uh, things, things like that uh, could, could have a profound impact. Uh, in, in the few body problem, quantum problem that I, you know, my group works on a lot, you know, to go beyond five quantum particles is, is beyond what, what we know how to, how to solve and uh, developing better and better ways of thinking and attacking the problem coupled with uh, improved computers uh, will, will allow you to, to solve these kinds of problems. Uh, like for, for one example, there's I think only one uh, realistic calculation today of DT nuclear fusion. There's only one group who's been able to do that in the world and just barely using incredible amount of supercomputer time. So uh, there's, there's so many phenomena that are exciting, uh, interest to, if you want to predict how the first stars in the universe were made, this is not going to be a company, but it's, it's a really fascinating scientific problem. What do the first stars look like? To understand that, you have to understand how three hydrogen atoms make an H2 molecule. Simple reaction. No one knows that yet. So these, these are the kinds of things that, you know, make me want to come to work in the morning. Can I add something yes. as a small application, as you say? The simplest one, which is fantastic. Take a single photon, send it on a beam splitter. It goes either on one side or on the other side. It's a perfect random number generator. 
the idea of a perfect random non-generator is a big challenge, okay? And a single photon going on a beam splitter, nobody can predict if it will be transmitted or reflected. This is why I say it's perfect. How do we know that it is perfect? Because if somebody could know where it will go, it means there would be hidden variables, okay? And the best random number generator based on that, you have uh, you emit a pair of photons, okay? You use one to do your uh, random number generator, and from time to time, you test Bell's inequality. If you violate Bell's inequality, you are sure there is no hidden variable. You are sure that nobody could predict. That means you have an idea. In addition, it can be done on a small chip like that, okay? It doesn't have to be a big cryostar or something like that. Think about these small applications. Yes, and uh, wow for photons, right? Uh, it's close to my heart and the heart of the entire photonics team. We do envision big applications for photonics and the emerging quantum science and technology. So let's talk a little bit about platforms. So we already talked about photons and fully agree that it can be made on a chip and it will be scalable. Um, but there were some other platforms mentioned as well. So I wonder if someone wants to comment on other platforms like Rydberg Atoms that we heard about and other uh, solar state systems and maybe say a few things uh, what they are good for and what you envision for uh, for the applications for with different platforms and what they will be beneficial for. So we can start the other way. Well, I'm not a platform kind of a guy. I think I'll defer to, to Vlad. <laughs> we can move to Vlad. <laughs> okay. Um, well, yes, of course, I'm a big fan of this photonics-based uh, quantum simulation uh, because the materials are there and it just we need really to perfect uh, sources, uh, single photon sources. But uh, I'm also very excited about uh, exotic uh, quant uh, material platforms such as uh, so-called topological quantum materials that uh, people sitting here, some of us working on this because the predictions are truly amazing. Uh, that actually that should enable scalable quantum computing. Uh, and at this point, it's hard to say which one is better because it probably depends on a particular application. Rydberg atoms, trapped ions, uh, these uh, topological quantum computers, uh, like uh, quantum spin liquids potentially, or let's say photonics-based quantum computing. But I'd like to bring the challenge which I think really important here because we probably would not go to the way that like making 10,000 of qubits, it's because error correction would be completely uh, not manageable. So the way many people think uh, is actually it's better to work with relatively small number of qubits, let's say 100, and then interconnect them. Uh, you would not get the full advantages like you would have with 10,000, uh, let's say, qubit. But still, if you would be able to connect, let's say, 100 qubits, which might be on a different platform. And here the problem would come. So naturally, we would like to have a quantum network. Let's say we want to connect uh, Pascal's uh, platform with, I don't know, with uh, superconducting qubits of IBM, or let's say, let's say Microsoft develops eventually this uh, uh, non-Ibillion Alien platform, and we would like to connect them into the internet. How would they have very different uh, characteristics, I mean, the, 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 the different way to correct the errors, so they're really different. How you could make them to work together as one uh, quantum system? That I see as one of the biggest challenges, because we already have several good quantum machines at the level of 100 or so, it could be approaching 1,000 qubits. Could we connect them and take kind of advantage of this? That's what I don't know how to solve, but I think that someone who would solve it, that, that would be a huge contribution to the field. Uh, platformers. It's difficult. Uh, ten years ago, <coughs> I had to fight hard in Brussels to uh, tell the people that their idea, they were asking me, what is the qubit on which we should put all our money? And I had a hard time to tell them, we don't know, let them progress and we will see there will be some kind of Darwinism and eventually some will survive. So I have no idea of what is the best platform, but I can tell you the one that I love. First, Photonic, because 
photons is my first love, okay? So when you have a first love, even when you do something else, you always think to your first love. So I would enjoy seeing when you can have two individual photons interacting with each other to make an entangled pair, then I will be so happy. But uh, I just want to show you how a symbol between quote uh, uh, technology can change the situation, and it is a case of Rydberg atoms. You know, Rydberg atoms, it's crazy. You have 300 or 500 uh, optical tweezers manipulate uh, individual each atom, moving, etc., individually. Do you think that they have 500 lasers? Not at all. They have a dynamic hologram, and by, do it, by calculation, they can calculate what is the phase they have to implement on their hologram, and with this, they can manipulate individual. Once again, it's using, in a smart way, a smart technology to address fundamental equations. You have heard my talk. The idea of using an acoustic wave to do my switch was the key. Without that, I would never have been on the stage in Stockholm with the king giving me the medal. It's because I had this idea, and moreover, it's be, when the company could, could not build my system, I worked and I had the idea of using water. All that was necessary to get the prize. I don't say you have to work for the prize, but it turns out that it is by really going in the details of technology that you can solve fundamental problems. Technology is good and interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Feels like to choose well, feels like you need to collapse wave function, which is dangerous. But the short answer I don't know, of course. It's um, but I I can say I've been um I mean I think different platform or most of these platforms they will be good for something. I think it's really actually wonderful thing we have a multiple this diversity of different platforms because I think the efforts people spend to you know improving to build these uh, different forms, qubits, for example. They are, will be good some, even though if not for what originally intended for. Even though maybe 75% work on kind of a material solid, but I'm, I should say personally, I'm very impressed by the progress atoms made in the last few years. And atoms has a great advantage. They are identical, guaranteed by nature almost. Absolutely. Right. That's, I think that's a really very intriguing advantage. However, I can also see, um, you know, they are, I mean, of course, it's challenging. I mean, right now, for front runner, we have current front runners, whether it's superconductor or ion. But, but you know, this is a long race. Even if we can call this a race, like one dimensional length, I mean, we don't know really in future what uh, some, some other system may t come. But um, there could be a situation a solid is very good because it's very dense. When, again, back to one of my favorite topics, sensing where you interact with the radiation or want to find dark matter, whatever, uh, that could be, th those qubits could be very good. Yep. Just two comments. And Mike? Uh, I think it would be presumptuous of me to say what is going to be the uh, final technology or platform. So I work on uh, a few. And uh, like most others, it's because of a natural inclination to the topic that originally got me into the technology. Um, I think that's not the proper way to evaluate technology and how they're gonna go. Uh, so what I've learned th through my time working in uh, industry is that scaling is a tremendous challenge. And you know, to say things, what happens on the one to 100 qubit level, um, you, know, you gotta start somewhere, but actually how to scale up to make something that's useful is a challenge unto itself. And um, I wouldn't claim to know which technology is going to prevail. I'm working on one because I think it has a potential advantage at scale, but I can't uh, guarantee that. And I also think that in the shorter term, there'll be lots of gains made um, in other platforms. So as we've seen, the derivative is probably the highest in Rydberg atoms right now and how fast that they are progressing, uh, whether that goes beyond a thousand, I can't answer that, but uh, it's fun to see what they can do over the next few years, that's for definitely sure. And um, I don't think we need to down-select because it doesn't make any sense at this point to down-select. Yeah. 
there isn't a silicon uh, quantum computer quite yet. So and until that day, I think the uh, we can live with multiple platforms, and they may have uh, specific functionalities for specific problems. Um, maybe we'll readdress this in ten years. Yes. Um, so should we take a couple of questions uh, from the audience? Yes, and you can address it, well, in the limit of time, I guess you could uh, ask a specific panelist or you just uh, will just address it and see who is ready to answer. Perfect. Yeah. Um, sorry, maybe I should sit down. Yeah, um, thank you so much for the panel and for, for the lecture. Um, I'm David Bernal, I'm a physicist, I'm a professor here in chemical engineering and I'm part of the quantum computing and artificial intelligence lab at NASA. So, and this question, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to follow because I, 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 I'm struggling with it myself. So if any of you has uh, any, any, any answer, I would really appreciate. And it has to do in training uh, new people getting into the field. In particular, what are your thoughts on how should we teach quantum computing or quantum mechanics even to particularly to non-physicists if, if there is, if, any, any kind of tips and tricks. I'm struggling with that uh, in order to set up my research group and I would really welcome any kind of advice. Thank you. Uh, thank, you thank you for this question because in fact we did not uh, touch yet upon the topic of workforce training and that's extremely important. Chris. I can tell you, <clears throat> I can tell you something about teaching quantum mechanics. One thing for sure, do not teach it starting with wave function uh, because representing because wave function position etc is continuous spectrum i think to understand quantum mechanics you have to start with two level systems choose the one you prefer coent energy from the first chapter tells you about polarization of photon and i think to understand really the spirit of quantum physics, you have to do it on two-level systems and do as many things as you can with two-level systems. Because starting with wave function, I know it's interesting to do quantum well, etc. But I think you don't learn really what is quantum physics by only solving uh, wave equation. Basically, it means solving wave equations. There is nothing different from having a Fabry-Perot interferometer with, a, with an electromagnetic wave or something like that. I think this is not real quantum physics. Of course, you have to do it at one point, but I think it's a big pedagogical mistake to start with that. So, uh, in contrast to what many people do. So, my advice would be think about that, not starting with wave functions. Any other input? I, I'd like to maybe comment because I've been teaching graduate quantum mechanics using Cohen Tanuji, uh, in fact. Um, I, I like to start with the postulates. I mean, this is the heart of quantum mechanics is, you know, how, how does measurement work? How do, what is the role of eigenvalues, eigenvectors? But this you is, need to have students who have enough math to yeah, an, a, a this linear is, algebra. This is a problem. If your students have a good knowledge of linear algebra, it's quite easy, I think. Yeah, but but yeah, I mean, you you posed it to someone who doesn't have that math background, and I mean, if you can't even explain the postulates of quantum mechanics, which require an understanding of eigen systems, uh, it's it's a you know it's going to make any understanding a little bit at a superficial level, except you know maybe in specific areas. Well, it, it, we are talking about how to teach students quantum, uh, but I think the problem is much, much bigger. And I would delegate this question to you, Sasha. I think you actually uh, spent more time thinking about this because I, one thing I, I, I learned that it's not only about teaching students, it's it's much bigger problem when it comes to workforce development. Maybe you want to comment on this. Well, um, yeah, there are many um, aspects um, of this uh, issue that we are talking about. So, uh, and, and starting from, um, from the fact that uh, it's both fundamental science, it's technology, as you mentioned, it's materials, it's computation, it's computer science. Um, and uh, we have to make sure that uh, we are providing opportunities for training for students with different background. Right. So how do we train 
in quantum someone that comes from computer science, right? Um, do we have like a year program, as you mentioned, so that they actually expose to quantum science so that they can actually feel comfortable and actually contribute? And the other way around, we must teach algorithms to our physics students so that they understand the algorithm language because there is no um, you know, way forward. Um, so there are many efforts that are directed towards um, uh, creating um, quantum curricula and quantum degrees, um, you know, these uh, micromasters and master in quantum engineering and science. Um, and that would be very important for, uh, not only for training uh, of the next generation of young scientists and engineers, but also for retraining. So there are many engineers and students with already, uh, you know, some level of preparedness, and then you give them a year um, so that they will feel um, comfortable working on, on quantum aspects. Um, and there are people actually that also are rethinking the K-12 education for our kids. And they say that maybe our bet on teaching um, from the very early age, the deterministic nature, it's always either white or black, uh, zero or one. Uh, maybe starting with uh, probabilistic methods that we teach even for you know, young kids, they can understand you know, coin tossing, um, would make the transition to quantum understanding much easier. If you accept at the early stages the probabilistic nature, um, then it could make it easier uh, to actually transition into quantum domain. So that's um, one of the viewpoints um, that is um, currently um, in the community working around quantum education. Can I <coughs> sure. approve what you say, but add something? Um, for me, due to my initial education in classical physics, uh, and particularly in uh, uh, um, stochastic, um, how do we say, stochastic optics, okay, stochastical optics. Uh, uh, I think I understood extremely well uh, classical probabilities, uh, stochastic function, etc., etc. And for me, the step in quantum was to understand that sometimes classical probabilities are not enough. It's exactly what Bell theorem is about. Bell theorem applies to almost everything except pairs of entangled particles. And so having a good understanding of this classical probability allows you to say, ah, here exactly. we have passed the frontier. For, for me, it's my way of reasoning. Each time I can do with classical physics, I do with classical physics. What is very important, I have my own intuition saying, <laughs> Here, maybe a frontier. Let us see what we have beyond the frontier. Yeah, very true. So, okay, there are many questions. Uh, let's start. Thank you. Dr. Aspe, thank you so much for being here today and traveling to, to visit with us here in West Lafayette, Indiana. We greatly appreciate it. I want to ask a non-technical question. I was friends with Dr. A. H. Negishi, who won the Nobel Prize, I believe, in 2010 for chemistry, and he was a faculty member here at Purdue. I knew him well, and he always enjoyed talking about his experience in Stockholm and receiving the Nobel Prize and getting to meet the princess and having such a wonderful dinner. And I was just wondering if you wanted to address that, because there, yes. although I would like for every person we, in this room we, to win we, a we, Nobel we, Prize, we may not have that opportunity. Okay. Can you tell us, please? Uh, it's, it, it's too bad that we... Uh, no longer have the computer because I have a, a few. Uh, I am going to tell you two different things. Stockholm. It turns out that physics is the first topic because it was first on the uh, testament of uh, Alfred Nobel. And it turns out that I was the first, probably because my name starts with A. Anyway, the committee decided. So I was the one going down the stairways, you know, the big stairway, with uh, the crown princess, you know, when I came and sat close to her and say, how should I call you, princess? And she told me, crown princess. <laughs> <laughs> but she added, or you can call me Victoria, which was, <laughs> okay. So this is a fantastic experience, but let's say that it's just for playing the real major thing is you are sitting like that, okay? And you are going to receive your medal. 
And I can tell you, I was the first to stand, once again, the first to stand up and walk to the king. So in the morning, they had trained me, this is what will happen, because the other one can watch me, but I could not watch anybody. So they had trained me in the morning. But when they call you, you have to stand up, go to the king and receive your medal. For me, I saw in my mind the day when I took for the first time the paper of John Bell, the idea of using the computer, how this idea came to my mind, thinking of my teacher in high school, etc. In a few seconds working, this is the most important moment when you go to receive the medal. The rest, princess, king, etc. is really fun but not more than that. Of course, it's fantastic. You have a limousine for you. Uh, from the first day you arrive at the airport, the limousine goes just close to the plane. You know, do you are like a president. You go down to the limousine, etc. It's fun. But the important thing is when you receive the medal. Any what? Working, Working with the price. Oh, the yes, of course, already. you have a privilege, you know. And, uh, you know, as soon as the door of the, of the plane opens, somebody come and they just pick you. Before anybody goes down the plane, they pick you. There is a car, a limousine to take you. But once again, it's, it's fun for one week. It's okay. Now, because you ask me about details, there is something about the moment when you receive the famous phone call. Phone call. I have photos of my cell phone showing the following thing. It was about, I was in a meeting in the Academy des Sciences, okay, and uh, there was a new uh, secretary at my institute, Institute Optique, and she sent me a short message saying, by the way, where can we see if you have the Nobel Prize or not? And nobody there, but she was new. She asked me that. And I was not irritated. I just replied, say, you know, I should already know because they are going to announce it in a moment. I should already know. Okay, good. Five minutes later, she sends me another short message saying, there is somebody in Stockholm insisting to talk to you. <laughs> Should I give this person your cell phone number? <laughs> I say yes, and then I just tell you the timing. And again, I have the proof, I have the copy of my screen, okay? Then I went, the telephone rings, the number comes from Sweden, okay? So my neighbor at the academy saw that, okay? But anyway, so I go, I go uh, out of the room, and then immediately they announce you the the prize, and there is an immediately an interview by somebody, an interview that is recording and will be sent. And they tell you, but you should not say before the official announcement. I say yes. So I enter the room of the Academy des Sciences, and my colleagues say, what's happening? And I say, the Nobel Committee doesn't allow me to tell you. <laughs> So everybody went on the computer, everybody went on the computer, on the cell phone, etc. And 10 minutes later, it was announced. So literally, I did not know it one hour before. I knew it, you know it at the last moment. This is not a legend. I had no idea that I would get the Nobel Prize this year. I knew that I could get it, but why this year? I absolutely no hint of that. And this is true. Well, at least it's my experience. Maybe other people know in advance, but not me, for sure. So it was fun when the secretary said, somebody in Stockholm wants, can I give this person your cell phone number? <laughs> yes! <laughs> well, let's maybe take one more. Um, and let's give a floor to someone else. <laughs> Hi, right, so my name is Anderson. I'm an upcoming uh, master's student in electrical engineering. And uh, with my quantum research, I've been working with multi uh, different models of quantum machine learning, uh, ranging from gate-based and then to like optical neural network. So I just wanted to ask you about like your thoughts on quantum machine learning in general. Thank you. No, this is really beyond the, you know, I'm not a theorist, uh, as, as you understand. I, 
what I understand, I think it's the basic of, uh, of quantum physics. But when it becomes too sophisticated, it's my students who do that. <laughs> and they explain me, okay? And so I'm sorry I cannot uh, answer your question. The only thing I can tell you is that uh, uh, if you think it is interesting, just pursue and do it. I, I, my, my real belief is that everybody should choose what is his field by the interest that you have in your field, not because somebody Nobel laureate or not tells you this is where sh you should go. You should go where you think that it interests you more because you will involve yourself totally in that. And this is where you have a chance to do something important. So, and uh, I would like to conclude this panel by asking the concluding question. If you would have to say one sentence defining how quantum is different from classical to a child or to a CEO, what would that sentence be? That's the hardest one during today. I would look for an example where in the classical world you can have any result and in the quantum world you have only a choice between two options. Once again, a two-level system. So you may take any kind of uh, example. You you drop a ball or something and you say, you see, it can be a, a, any place. Anyway. But in quantum, it would be either here or there. And I would add, but just to puzzle, and moreover, there are situations where it, in, in some situation, it can be both here the and time. there. But I would first say, if I drop it, it cannot be in any place. It will be here or there. For me, that's really the most important thing in, in quantum physics. That's quantization. The word Perfect. quantization means that you don't have continuous value. This is why I think that this wave function and all that is really misleading. Quantum physics is about quantization, a limit, discrete number of possibilities. That's a fantastic one. I disagree. <laughs> the continuum states of the hydrogen atom are important. Yes, listen to Chris. You are right, but, uh, <laughs> but from a pedagogical point of view, I think it's totally confusing. Okay, so what would your sentence be? Yes. To... Give your... uh, <laughs> actually, I liked your answer very, very much in terms of conveying the essence of, you know, what is different about the quantum world. But, but I, I do think the continua are important, too. And they underlie I all. I say it's not important. I say from a pedagogical point of view, it's a mistake to start with that. Yeah, and it would be a mistake to omit it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Someone else has a sentence? Well, I guess since we are talking about kids, I would try to use their language. I guess what I would repeat what uh, Einstein said spooky, uh, going beyond. Uh, whatever you could imagine, and uh, dream. And if you dream, don't limit your dreams. So that would be my answer, because quantum does require kind of enthusiasm uh, to go through this, because it is challenging. It's not based on our everyday experience. It does take some work. But in the end, it's uh, what could be more exciting. Young? One word would be possibilities, plural. The, uh, you mentioned being at a different place, different time, allowing to potentially do many different things at different time. We love to do ultimate multitasking and tremendously improve efficiency. So that would be the, how I convey to kids or CEO yeah. or whatever. I like the superposition notion. And um, talking about superposition, I think uh, the way we're thinking and our emotions is a great example. Being um, joyful and sad at the same time is something you can easily explain. 
You can be sad or you can be really joyful, or you can be both at the same time. Yeah. And that's non classical. It's Penrose's idea and about quantum brains. Yeah, quantum brain and quantum cognition is one of the things that also fascinates me. And uh, I think, uh, well, at least some people, I would say 100% have quantum brains. <laughs> Any other uh, insights on a concluding? Well, that's been an exciting panel. I hope everyone would agree. And we have some time after the panel to just mingle, stay around, and uh, get uh, more idea sharing um, and opportunities um, to interact. Thank you, our panelists, very much for exciting panel and all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.